Welcome back to Harbour Unbox. Today we're taking a look at the new, or maybe the old Ryzen 750-700G, depending on how you look at it. And that's because this thing was actually released back in April of this year, though only for use in OEM systems like the box that I have here. Anyway, last month AMD did come out, they announced the 5700G, along with the 5600G, would be coming to the retail market in August, so next month. Ever since these new APUs were announced, I have been trying to get my hands on one. But of course, being that I am from Australia, it has not been easy. And even today, I still don't think there is a single 5700G system for sale in Australia. However, about five to six weeks ago now, I did manage to find an HP Pavilion desktop PC from an online seller who would ship to Australia. So I snapped one up as I was very interested to see what this thing could do. Since then, other reviewers have managed to get their hands on these new APUs, and no surprises that they're much easier to get in other regions. But with my purchase finally arriving last week, I thought, what the hell? We're still three weeks away from the official retail release, so I might as well get testing. So I pulled the 5700G out of the HP system, installed it in our AM4 test system, and got to it. But before we get into the results, let's quickly discuss what the 5700G is all about, as well as its little brother, the 5600G. The Ryzen 7 5700G is an 8-core, 16-thread processor using AMD Zen 3 architecture, clocking up to 4.6GHz with a 16MB L3 cache and a 65W TDP. Now, what makes this model different to the other Ryzen 5000 series parts that we already have is the integrated graphics. But sadly, it's not RDNA 2 or even RDNA graphics, but rather Vega, with 8 compute units clocked up to 2GHz. So this is the same Cezanne die that AMD has been using for their Ryzen Mobile 5000 APUs, like the Ryzen 9 5900HX. And that means it's a monolithic die rather than chiplet based. As a result of this, along with the fact that AMD has had to squeeze in the GPU, half of the L3 cache has been removed, dropping the 5700G down to 16 megabytes. So that's likely gonna have quite a negative impact on performance when compared to parts such as the 5800X. Then complementing the 5700G is the smaller Ryzen 5 5600G, which is a 6-core model clocked up to 4.4GHz. The GPU has also been downgraded with just 7 Vega compute units clocked up to 1.9GHz, and we get the same 16MB L3 cache. AMD is positioning these processors as lower cost Zen 3 alternatives to the current X models, with no integrated graphics that have been on the market for some time now. The company acknowledged that there's been a lot of demand for non-X CPUs, and apparently these parts are set to fill that gap. Unfortunately though, these aren't really the low cost CPUs that many of you have been looking for. The Ryzen 5 5600G for example, that's priced at $260 US, that's $40 less than the Ryzen 5 5600X. Now this is cheaper of course, but not the $200 to $220 that many of you were hoping a Ryzen 5 5600 non-X would slot into. Meanwhile, the Ryzen 7 5700G will sit between the 5600X and 5800X in terms of pricing at $360, so again, not quite as cheap as we would have liked, especially given the big reduction in L3 cache and the fact that they dropped the PCI Express 4.0 support in favour of the ageing 3.0 standard. Anyway, roughly translated, that means fellow Australians can expect to pay around $500, and that makes sense given that I had to pay roughly $1,100 for the HP system, though a fair chunk of that cost did go towards shipping. So, to find out if that was a wise investment, we need to get into the benchmarks. And for this, I've split the testing into three sections. First, we're going to look exclusively at CPU performance by testing the 5700G in applications using an RTX 2080 Ti, so I can compare it with the rest of our CPU data. Then I want to see how well it works with the Vega integrated graphics, and for this I'll be comparing it to the Ryzen 5 3400G and Core i7-11700 using their integrated graphics. And then I'll also throw in some discrete graphics cards which were tested on the Ryzen 5 5600X. Then finally I've also run quite a lot of discrete GPU tests using the GeForce RTX 3090, allowing us to compare the 5700G to a range of other CPUs with a powerful graphics card. So that should be interesting and it will give us a good idea of what kind of headroom this APU offers gamers should they upgrade down the track to a discrete graphics card. So let's get into it. Starting with Cinebench R20 multi-core performance, we see that the Ryzen 7 5700G is good for a score of 5,432 points, which is quite good, though it is slower than the 5800X and 11900K, trailing by around a 10% margin. 
It was around 9% faster than the 10700K, so there is that, but it appears that the lack of L3 cache is hurting performance here, given that the core count is identical to the 5800X and clock speeds are also much the same. And here we're seeing that when looking at single core performance, the 5700G is slower than the 5600X, though we're only talking about a mere 3% reduction in single thread performance. And when compared to AMD's previous best desktop APU, the 3400G, we're looking at a 39% increase in single core performance. Moving on, the 7-zip compression performance is only slightly better than the Core i7-10700K, and therefore isn't much better than the 6-core 5600X or the older 8-core 3700X. So while the performance is certainly respectable, it's not exactly what you might have expected from an 8-core Zen 3 processor. Decompression performance looks a bit better, and here the 5700G was 9% slower than the 5800X, which isn't too bad, and it was able to outpace the 1100K, so relative to Intel, it is a good result. As seen in the Cinebench R20 single thread test, the 5700G is slower than the 5600X, and as a result it trailed the 6-core Zen 3 processor by a 10% margin when testing with Adobe After Effects. In fact, here we're only looking at performance that's roughly equivalent to the Core i5-11400F or Ryzen 7 3700X. And it's a similar story in Adobe Photoshop. Again, the 5700G is really only able to match the Core i5-11400F, making it 12% slower than the 5800X and 5% slower than the 5600X. Then we have the Premiere Pro 2020 results, and here the 5700G was 11% slower than the 5800X, as it delivered 3700X slash 10700K like performance, and that made it more like a 6-core Zen 3 processor rather than an 8-core model. Finally, we have Blender, the last of the application benchmarks, and here the 5700G was 8% slower than the 5800X, but almost 20% faster than the 5600X, so a reasonable result there. As for power consumption, as we often saw, the 5700G delivered 3700X light performance, and in terms of power usage, it's also very similar, and that meant it also matched the 10600K. We're looking at a 15% reduction in total system usage when compared to the 5800X. So overall, a good level of efficiency from this 8-core APU. Okay, time for some integrated graphics testing. So for this data, we're using the Vega graphics of the 5700G, along with the iGPU in the 3400G and 11700. Then for comparison, we have the Radeon RX 550, GeForce GTX 1060 in the three and six gigabyte versions, as well as the Radeon RX 5500 XT, all of which were tested with the Ryzen 5 5600X. So here we can see that for a modern and demanding title like Assassin's Creed Valhalla, the 5700G's Vega graphics just isn't powerful enough, at least if you want better than a 30 FPS experience, which I'd have to assume is the case. We are at 1080p here using the lowest possible quality settings, and yet the 5700G was good for just 33 FPS on average. So the only option here is to drop the resolution down further to something like 720p, and at that point things are getting pretty desperate. All of that said, the 5700G was 32% faster than the 3400G, and, well, a lot faster than the Core i7-11700, and therefore is a much better solution than any of the Intel desktop LJ1200 processors when it comes to gaming with the iGPU. When compared to the discrete graphics cards, we're looking at Radeon RX 550 slash GeForce GT 1030 Lite performance. So any half decent modern graphics card is gonna be miles faster. Take the Radeon RX 5500 XT, for example, that spat out 88 FPS on average. The 5700G is much more usable and less demanding games, such as Rainbow Six Siege. Here it was good for 65 FPS on average using the medium quality preset, so with low it will be possible to keep frame rates above 60 FPS at all times. Again, this was roughly equivalent to RX 550 performance, so almost 40% faster than the 3400G, which really is a big improvement. Horizon Zero Dawn, like Assassin's Creed Valhalla, has been tested using the lowest possible quality settings at 1080p. And again, it's not possible to achieve playable performance with the 5700G, or any of these iGPUs for that matter. Shadow of the Tomb Raider is a much older demanding AAA title, but again, even with the lowest possible quality settings, the 5700G is not really able to achieve playable performance, depending on what you deem playable. The game is technically playable at 37 FPS, but it's not exactly an enjoyable experience, at least in my opinion, and in fact I'd rather just play an older title in the franchise. 
Doom Eternal, on the other hand, was playable using the lowest quality settings, and the experience wasn't half bad with frame rates staying above 40 FPS. This is actually a big deal for the 5700G, as the 32% performance increase over the 3400G made the game significantly better to play. As expected, given what we've seen in games such as Assassin's Creed Valhalla and Horizon Zero Dawn, it's not really possible to play Death Stranding with the 5700G as frame rates hovered around 30 FPS. While this is a massive improvement from the 3400G, it's sadly still not very playable, so you'd have to drop down to 720p here. Dirt 5 is somewhat playable with 39 FPS on average and a 1% low of 33 FPS, and this was a 22% increase over the 3400G. So not quite as impressive in terms of gains compared to what we've seen in other titles, but still decent performance overall. Biomutant is yet another new game that you can't run on the 5700G at 1080p, at least not at satisfactory frame rates. Here we're looking at just 27 FPS on average, and interestingly that's significantly down on the Radeon RX 550, so perhaps there is some sort of driver issue here. Watch Dogs Legion also can't be played at 1080p despite using the lowest quality settings. Here we're looking at just 28 FPS for the 5700G, so the game wasn't playable. Another new AAA title is Outriders, and once again, despite using the lowest possible quality settings at 1080p, the 5700G wasn't able to deliver playable performance and oddly wasn't any faster than the 3400G. I suspect this is down to some kind of driver issue, and perhaps we saw the same thing in Biomutant. However, a game that you can quite comfortably play is Counter-Strike Global Offensive. Here the 5700G managed 112 FPS on average, which is a 35% increase over the 3400G, and that pushed us into high refresh rate territory. So that is quite impressive. This is more than twice what you'll get out of the Core i7-11700, or really any 11th gen desktop core series processor for that matter. Finally, it is worth noting that this performance was achieved using the medium quality settings, so you can increase frame rates further by dropping to low, if you wish. It was also possible to get up around 60 FPS on average in F1 2020 at 1080p using the lowest quality settings, and this 28% performance increase over the 3400G was very noticeable and did lead to a much better gaming experience. So pretty solid performance there, and good news for F1 fans on a budget. Finally, we have Dota 2, which has been tested using the highest quality settings, and here the 5700G was good for 73 FPS on average. That's a 33% performance boost over the 3400G. Dialing down the quality settings will net you significantly more performance in Dota 2, especially given that the CPU side of things is very powerful with the 5700G, so 1440p gameplay will be possible here. Okay, so time for some discrete GPU testing with the GeForce RTX 3090, and we'll start with F1 2020. Here the 5700G is comparable to Intel's previous generation 8-core processor, the Core i7-10700K. So when compared to the 5800X, it is 6% slower, which really is an insignificant margin, especially given we're talking about over 250 FPS at 1080p using the RTX 3090, but it's quite clear that halving the L3 cache has reduced performance here. The 5700G was also slightly slower than the 5800X when testing with Rainbow Six Siege, but we're only talking about a 4% margin here, and the APU was good for 485 FPS, so that is also pretty good. That said, as far as 8 core CPUs go, it was slower than the 10th and 11th gen core series parts, and only 7% faster than the 10600K. But still, overall, a very strong result, even if it is a little on the slow side for a Zen 3 based product. Next up we have Horizon Zero Dawn, and here the 5700G was 8% slower than the 5800X, delivering a 10600K light performance with 151 FPS on average. Again, this is quite a good result in the grand scheme of things, despite being the slowest Zen 3 CPU we've seen. The 5700G did struggle a little bit in Borderlands 3, averaging 151 FPS, and that meant it was basically mirroring the performance of the 3700X and 3600. So a bit disappointing there, it was also slower than the Core i3-10100 and Core i7-7700K, and a range of other CPUs. Though it is worth noting this isn't a particularly strong title for Ryzen, so the 5700G was only 6% slower than the 5800X. The margin to the 5800X did widen in Watch Dogs Legion. Here the 5700G was 12% slower, rendering 101 FPS on average. And once again, that meant it was delivering 3700X light performance, making it slower than 6-core 10th gen core series processors. 
Death Stranding benefits a lot from the massive L3 cache of the Zen 3 chiplet CPUs, as here the 5800X allowed for 214 FPS, making it the fastest CPU tested. Meanwhile, the 5700G was 15% slower, and that dropped it down to the Core i5-11400F, though it was still 12% faster than the 3700X, so a better result than what we've seen in most of the other games. Interestingly, in Shadow of the Tomb Raider, we saw a massive 20% decline in performance of the 5700G when compared to the 5800X, and that meant it was good for just 132 FPS on average, again delivering Ryzen 7 3700X and Core i5-10600K light performance. Last up we have Hitman 2, and again the 5700G was a lot slower than the 5800X, this time trailing by a 15% margin. This dropped it down to the Core i5-10600K, though it was 8% faster than the 3700X. So when it comes to more CPU limited gaming with a discrete GPU, the Ryzen 7 5700G, it's not amazing, and it appears as though having all the cores crammed into a single die, it doesn't really help, rather the cache capacity plays a much more vital role. That said, performance isn't bad and it's certainly the best we've ever seen from an AMD APU. The 5700G is a powerful CPU and it was able to match the gaming performance of the Core i5-10600K and I think most of you will agree that's a pretty great gaming CPU. Moreover, when compared to the 3400G, we're looking at a massive 88% increase in gaming performance. So for those of you upgrading to a discrete graphics card, you won't need to start all over again with an entirely new CPU. But if you're expecting 5800X levels of performance, you might be a bit disappointed to learn that on average, the 5700G was 11% slower. That said, remember we're using a GeForce RTX 3090 at 1080p here, so those of you gaming at 1440p or higher with an extreme GPU, or in particular something that's a bit more wallet friendly than an RTX 3090, there'll basically end up being no difference between these two Zen 3 based Ryzen 7 processors. Okay, so that's how the AMD Ryzen 7 5700G performs. Now what to make of it? I guess the real question is, who is this APU for? Who in our audience should consider purchasing it? Now typically, recommending these APUs has been pretty straightforward. Take the Ryzen 5 3400G for example. At $150 US, it was a very affordable processor, and with a budget motherboard and memory combo, it was possible to piece together an entry-level platform for well under $400 US. And such a build was suitable for casual gaming, mostly at 720p, but it could game and was also excellent for use as a home theater PC. The 5700G though, it isn't really suitable for budget builds as the Ryzen 7 branding would probably imply. At $360 US, it costs roughly as much as the 3400G with motherboard and memory, so if you're after a more premium home theater PC setup, maybe the 5700G will be suitable depending on the configuration that you're going for. Right now, I feel the most likely use case for our viewers would be to use the integrated graphics of the 5700G as a sort of stopgap solution, make do with the value of graphics until you can buy a new graphics card at a reasonable price. Those of you wishing to build a brand new computer right now can land parts like the Ryzen 7 5800X for below the MSRP. There's also loads of well-priced B550 motherboards on the market, 16 gigabytes of DDR4-3200 memory that can be had for well under $100 US, and availability of all other components is very good. Think stuff like cases, power supplies, and storage. The only thing stopping you from building a new computer today is of course graphics card availability and pricing. So in a way, the 5700G allows you to build now and upgrade the graphics later. The only issue with that being that for those of you focused on gaming performance, the 5700G is inferior to the Ryzen 5 5600X, and yet it costs $60 more. I bring this up because for $100 US, you can quite comfortably land a GeForce GT 1030 on eBay for $100 US, and that'll match or beat the performance of the integrated Vega graphics. But, if you really care about value, then you'd ignore AMD altogether and just go with Intel. The Core i5-10400F can be had for just $180 US, and that affords you a $180 US budget for the graphics card, and I've seen secondhand 3GB GTX 1060s selling for roughly that price over the past few weeks. So as we saw in the short term, that will net you 100% more performance in modern games like Assassin's Creed Valhalla, and more critically, enable playable frame rates. Then once you can buy a more powerful graphics card, we saw that with the RTX 3090, that the 10400F is basically identical to the 5700G anyway. 
So in my opinion, it's going to be very rare that the 5700G will make sense for gamers. In short, like all AMD Zen 3 based processors, the Ryzen 7 5700G is simply too expensive. And in my opinion, for this part to make sense, it needs to be priced no more than $300 US. Of course, if you think I've missed an angle here, then please do let me know about it in the comment section and then I'll reevaluate for our official review, which I suppose is coming next month. Haven't heard anything from AMD at this point, but yeah, that would be the assumption. And on that note, I won't be testing the 5600G early. We haven't been able to get our hands on one of those. I didn't want to spend another thousand dollars plus on a system and wait multiple weeks to get it. So I thought we'd just see if we get our hands on this one and test that out. And well, after quite a long delay, we were able to. But yeah, that's going to do it for this this early early-ish look. Not the earliest look, but an earlier look than the official reviews, I suppose, is the best way to put it. But yeah, if you did like this, then do give us a thumbs up. You can subscribe for more content. And if you'd like to become a Harbour Unbox community member and allow us to go spend 1100 Australian dollars on a system just to get a CPU out of it for a review, then you can sign up to our Floatplane or Patreon accounts. Either of them will work. You'll get access to our exclusive Discord chat, awesome server there. Monthly live streams with two of myself, that will be coming up, I think in about a week from now, but we do one every single month. Q and A's, behind the scenes content, a lot of cool stuff there. So if you are interested, the link's in the video description. Also, we I think this is only around for two more weeks, the, the uh, hardware unavailable merch. So if you want a t-shirt or a hoodie and the various colors we offer, then check the uh, Harder Unboxed merch store out. Again, the link for that is also in the video description. But if not, perfectly fine. And I would like to just thank you for watching this video. I'm your host, Steve, and I'll see you again next time.